Hello everybody, my name is Rachel and it's time for another weekly wrap-up wherein I tell you about the books I finished in the past week. I've had a very, very excellent reading week. My tactic of only reading books and works that I am very excited about is paying off because I finished four books. Two of them were five stars and two of them were four stars. I've had this mental shift and I just feel more positive about reading in general, which is good. So on to the books. The first thing I want to talk about is Cold Welcome by Elizabeth Moon. This book is the first in a new series, Military Science Fiction, about the character Kailara Vada, whose first story is told in the Vada's War series, which is five books. I love those books. I was very excited about this. This is one of my most anticipated books of the year, and I really enjoyed it. It wasn't perfect. I found there to be a couple of flaws, perhaps in believability and in the abruptness of the end, but it was still a very solid story and I enjoyed the meat of it. I will be talking about this more in a separate review, which will be out this coming week. The next thing I read and loved was Giant Days Volume 3 by John Allison. This is a slice of life comic about a group of best friends in their first year at university. I think it takes place in England as well. And I love this. I love the storylines. I mostly just like seeing these characters in their hijinks and in their dating lives and everything. It is funny and it gets a bit bizarre at times, but it's also relatable. <laughs> I've actually found myself uh, relating quite a bit to one of the characters, Daisy, who was like homeschooled and everything. I am not as like sheltered as she <laughs> was by any means, but it's just really funny for me to pick up on some of these things that I have felt or experienced myself when I myself did not have the typical university experience and, and all of that. But mainly it's really fun and I enjoy the artwork as well. This artwork in this volume is by Max Saren. He's replaced the original illustrator whose artwork I also really enjoyed, but at this point I've adjusted to the new artwork and I think it's relatively similar to the old, so I am cool with that. I already really, really want the next couple of volumes. The Dark Days Pact by Alison Goodman. This is the sequel to The Dark Days Club, which I read a couple of weeks ago, and as you may remember, I loved that book, but The Dark Days Pact was even better. It's kind of rare, I think, for a sequel to eclipse the first book, but I think that has happened here. It is well-researched Regency-era historical fantasy, and I am just down with this series so much right now. This series is about Lady Helen, who discovers she is a reclaimer in the first book. She's one of about eight or so in England and only a handful around the world who have the ability to fight demons and to absorb their energy. In the first book, Lady Helen learned that she was a reclaimer and she became Lord Carlston's protege. He's another reclaimer with a slightly shady past because he may have killed his wife or he may not have. In the second book, she's not living with Lord Carlston. She's living in the household of his aides who are not reclaimers, but she is training with Carlston and is becoming a fully fledged member of the Dark Days Club. It turns out that Lord Carlston has a condition where he's kind of going crazy and mad and he can't control himself anymore. And they think that it's because he's absorbed too much like demon energy. This is the eventual fate of most reclaimers that they absorb so much energy they can't get rid of it and they kind of go crazy. They don't want this to happen. He's actually very young and this shouldn't be happening yet. So they don't know what's going on. They think that there might be something else happening that they can fix and bring him back to himself, basically. The plot of The Dark Days Pact is basically that Lady Helen and some other people are trying to retrieve the journal of a reclaimer's aid. It was like written in blood and it will probably be an artifact to be used in a magical ritual that could be used to kill all the reclaimers maybe or open the gates to hell anyway don't want them to use it because something bad will happen there are so many things about this book and the series that appeal to me i think that the historical aspect set in the regency period is very well researched and presented it feels very realistic even though we're talking about a fantastic story here and it explores very well how a woman 
kind of constrained by gender roles can be a reclaimer and how she is viewed by men doing this job who think that she is weak or unsuited to it. That dynamic, that tension between her and men who want to basically use her as a receptacle for all the evil stuff they have to absorb, and then the men who think this is a terrible thing and want her to become a fully fledged reclaimer is very interesting. The romantic aspect can be kind of maddening because on the one hand we have somebody like Lord Carlston who is the dark, brooding, mysterious man with some great qualities, but he's kind of got black marks against him in society. He's probably still married to another woman, but he views Lady Helen positively. He thinks she can do the job and he doesn't want to stand by and just protect her. He wants to train her and enable her. And then you have perhaps the more suitable suitor, Lord Selburn, who wants to protect her. Like, he is actually very willing to overlook all this crazy stuff going on. He's not turned off by how unladylike she's acting. And yet at the same time, he's way too protective. He's way too, like, paternalistic, I guess, and he's not willing to let go. So, I'm almost down with either of these two romantic options, except they both have things that are making me really angry. <laughs> anyway, I have just been super incoherent. I can't really remember what I have said about this book, except I enjoyed it. I have surprised even myself and how invested I have become in it. I really care about the characters and their relationships, and I need the next book right now. And lastly, I have to talk about All the Single Ladies by Rebecca Traister. The subtitle of this book is Unmarried Women and the Rise of an Independent Nation, and it is very much about what it is like to be an unmarried woman today in the U.S. and the history of how we got here. How is it that the numbers of single people in the U.S. have risen to pretty dramatic highs over a couple of decades? or actually over the last hundred years or so, depending on how far back you want to go. So, some time ago I read a book called Spinster, which was supposed to be about this. It was very badly mismarketed as a book about single women and what that's like in the U.S. today, and it really wasn't. It was more like the author's pretty personal journey of reading some female authors who were at various points single or unmarried and how that shaped her and the fact that she was living a single life, etc. Unfortunately, that book was really undermined by the fact that many people, myself included, don't think that the author was ever really single. She was always dating or in very long-term or committed relationships and then she eventually married. So when the author herself is trying to pass herself off as a single woman but really wasn't, and the book was really more about literary figures in some way rather than a vast swath of unmarried women. It just didn't work. And when I read that book, I think it was Libby, actually, who told me that All the Single Ladies was probably the book about the subject that I really wanted to read, and it is, because it really is about what it is like to be unmarried and a woman in the U.S., and the history of how we got to this point. It really gives statistics and numbers and evidence. I learned a lot of interesting things from this book, and really it made me think harder about my own situation. It's great that this book discusses the positives of single life, which I have experienced, but it also talks about the negatives, about the consequences and the fears that single women have. The fact that society is built around married couples is really difficult sometimes. And I actually was finding myself getting a little anxious when, like, the fears section came around because, yeah, I have really wondered sometimes about what my life will be like when I don't have a spouse or children to take care of me. When, like, I'm on my deathbed or if I have a medical condition, I could die and I would be completely alone. Like, there wouldn't be anybody to help me because by that point, my parents will probably be dead. <laughs> This is terrifying, but it's something you have to really think about and like plan for when you intend, when you think it's very likely that you'll be single your entire life. But there are also positives, like privacy. I have my own space to myself and I like it that way. <laughs> I can do whatever I want to in my own home. There's a little section about like developing your own quirks and habits when you live completely alone and then being like really self-conscious when other people come over and you feel like you have to not be yourself. I've totally experienced that. I do really random things in my house that I would never do when other people are around, but they feel normal to me now. 
And lastly, I want to say that the thing that made me think the most about my own situation is the beginning of the book, which talks about history and the legal precedents that gave women more rights and actually made it possible for women to be single and not marry out of economic necessity or social pressure. Because I had to take a step back and think about what had to happen in my own family for me to exist. My parents are probably a really huge factor in this because they were unusual for their decade as well. My mother waited until a very late age, given the national average, to get married and then to have children. When my parents had children in their early 30s in the 90s, that was odd. That, you know, that is much later than the national average was then. And the fact that I have parents who deferred marriage or who viewed marriage differently and, and uh, the influence of my family's and my extended family's beliefs about gender roles and, and marriage and children and everything and education, like education for women in the family, that is like hugely influential in my own experience. It's interesting to consider very closely why I am single. How did I get this way and why do I just take it for granted? I have never thought I was weird or doing something extraordinary by being single and getting through a lot of the lifetime milestones. This is just the way I am. But reading this book made me realize that somebody like me was literally impossible a hundred years ago or even 50 years ago. I highly recommend this book if you are looking for reading material about the single life, about unmarried women, and about how women end up single or choose the single life willingly. That's it for my reading week. It was a bunch of excellent books that either entertained me greatly or made me think very hard about my own life. <laughs> If you have read any of these books and you want to discuss them, please comment down below because I would love to hear from you. I hope you're having a wonderful weekend and I will talk to you again soon. Bye.